Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our Peace Health webinar on ADHD, what you need to know. The information presented today is general in nature and does not replace the advice for your personal health care provider. In fact, we do encourage you to talk with your doctor about specific questions that are related to both your diet and your health condition. My name is Summer Meyer. I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our two guest speakers, I do want to remind you that Peace Health is safe, open, and ready to help when you need us. And it is now easier than ever because we offer video visit appointments. So if you haven't set up your My Peace Health account, you can do so, and there you can track appointments, your vaccinations, receive test results, and manage your prescriptions. If you already have an account, be sure to log in and confirm your contact information is up to date. In today's webinar, I would like to invite you to engage with us by voting in the polls, asking questions, and completing the survey at the end. So with that housekeeping out of the way, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Lloyd. Dr. Lloyd completed his undergraduate and doctoral education in California. He is extremely passionate about being in a helping profession, and he's worked with Navy SEALs. He also enjoys family, watching movies, building Legos, and exploring music. Dr. Lloyd works with us out of our Vancouver Peace Health Cascade Park Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Lloyd. And also we have with us today, Dr. Balasu, who graduated medical school in Romania and completed her residency in New York. She's board certified in general psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry. She's worked with us for the last 16 years at our Longview location, a child's place as a child psychiatrist. And she enjoys spending time with her family. She loves outdoor activities and traveling the world. So welcome, Dr. Balasu. I'll go ahead now and turn it over to Dr. Lloyd to get us started with a brief overview of today's webinar. Thank you, Summer. I'm excited to be here to talk to you all about ADHD because I think it's such an important topic. Before we dive right in, um, this is our roadmap uh, for where we're going today. Uh, we're go we'll start by just kind of talking about what ADHD is, defining it, busting some of the myths about ADHD so that you're ready and prepared to kind of make an appointment and start this process if, it, if ADHD is something that you're concerned about. Then we'll talk about testing uh, what a good assessment or evaluation for ADHD might include or what it should include, and even other diagnoses to consider in addition to ADHD. Next, we'll discuss treatment. Uh, we'll talk about what the evidence supports, what history supports, um, and this is where Dr. Balasu will give you some details about medication specifically for treating ADHD. Then we'll talk about the treatment plan, uh, how to be an advocate for your child in different settings, whether it's your parenting skills at home and setting things up in a certain way, advocating certainly with the school system to support your child's needs. And finally, we'll finish with some time for questions. So we're going to spend some time quite a bit of time here just in this right here on this slide talking about what ADHD really is. Um, I mentioned that it's a, it's a really, I think it's a really important topic because it affects such a large number of individuals. Uh, recent estimates suggest that 6.1 million, that's about 9.4% of children in the US have been diagnosed with ADHD. Worldwide, that decreases down to about 5% of children. Um, but we think that there's several reasons for that. So these statistics make ADHD the most commonly diagnosed neurodevelopmental disorder in childhood. Neurodevelopmental meaning that ADHD is a brain-based disorder. So one of the myths about ADHD I want to kind of bust right here is that it's not just a lazy child. It's not just an unmotivated child. It's not just the product of 
uh, bad parenting or a system that's not set up for that child. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's a brain-based disorder. When ADHD was first documented in 1902 by doctors, it was primarily um, described as a behavior disorder. Um, mostly this was that kind of typical bad behavior, disruptive behavior, and mostly describing boys. But our understanding and even our language about ADHD has evolved over time. Since about the 1980s, um, we've advanced our understanding of br the brain and just neuroscience in general. And specifically with ADHD, we've come to understand that ADHD is caused by a decrease of neurotransmitters in very specific parts of the brain. A neurotransmitter is a chemical that your brain produces and uses to send signals to, to uh, different parts of the brain. We know that there are about four different parts of the brain that can be affected by this decrease in neurotransmitters, but we're not quite as advanced yet in our neuroscience and understanding to always know exactly which part of the brain is affected um, with ADHD. So when we talk about ADHD, we, it's kind of become a buzzword or it's pretty common in um, popular culture to talk about ADHD. Almost any time somebody has a hard time focusing or paying attention, we go, oh, that person's ADHD. But ADHD, I wanna emphasize, is disorder, as a disorder, it's a deficit of attention. Um, one of the myths of ADHD is that, doesn't everybody have a hard time focusing or paying attention when something's not interesting or something's not fun or you're not motivated? I wanna emphasize that ADHD is an attention deficit it's a deficit in the ability to control attention, to manage attention, to resist distractions, not that you can't ever pay attention and focus. So ADHD literally stands for attention deficit. There's a deficit, hyperactivity disorder. So this is not just your typical child who's having a hard time controlling their energy or having a hard time focusing when it's something that they don't like to do. Now there are three subtypes of ADHD when we talk about the specific diagnosis, and those three subtypes correspond to two different symptom sets. And these are, these are uh, behaviors and symptoms that most people are pretty familiar with when we talk about ADHD. The first symptom, symptom set are inattentive symptoms. So this might include uh, making careless mistakes, being easily distracted, and those distractions can be internal or external. Um, not seeming to listen when being spoken to, having a hard time following directions, difficulty organizing things, sometimes even outright avoiding or disliking tasks that take a lot of attention, that take a lot of motivation and energy and mental energy, um, sometimes being forgetful or losing things. This first symptom set, the inattentive symptom set, if that's the primary feature, then we will diagnose um, ADHD, primarily inattentive subtype. Some people still use an older term for this, ADD. So if you have questions about what's ADHD versus ADD, that's it. It's really just your ADHD is primarily the inattentive type. Now, the second symptom set of ADHD includes the hyperactive or impulsive symptoms. So this is maybe fidgeting or squirming, having trouble staying in one place or waiting your turn, maybe excessive running or climbing or spinning. I have some patients that when we open the door to the office, they don't walk in and come and sit down. They run in and do a, do a front flip head first into the couch. Um, sometimes it's trouble staying quiet or being quiet when the setting kind of requires it. It can be extreme impatience, having a hard time waiting your turn, always seeming on the go or like driven like a motor or even excessive talking, interrupting or just blurting things out. Sometimes these are the kids who are really energetic, really creative, creative, really funny. Maybe it's the second grade boy who tells the fart joke in class and everybody laughs. But then when he does it 15 times in a row, his friends are, are not laughing anymore. So you can see how that might cause some social challenges for kids. Um, sometimes we call these, we describe these kids like um, having a Ferrari engine with bicycle brakes. They've got all this power, all these ideas, all this energy and their brain just isn't quite equipped to regulate it. When those are the primary symptoms, we diagnose ADHD, primarily hyperactive, impulsive type. So those are the two symptom sets of ADHD, but the third 
uh, diagnosis, the third subtype of ADHD is the combined subtype. And so this one's pretty common. This is when you're not only showing primarily the inattentive symptoms or primarily the hyperactive impulsive symptoms, but you really have a combination of the two. Sometimes when I'm talking to parents about ADHD for the first time, um, they're having a hard time kind of grasping that it's not just a behavioral disorder, that it really is a brain-based thing. It's not the child's choice. And so I, sometimes I describe it this way. If I ask you to go ahead and dig me a hole, say a four foot hole, and I say, uh, you've got an hour to do it. And I really incentivize you like for a kid, maybe I'm gonna buy you a, a PlayStation 5 or you're gonna get a week at Disneyland if you can accomplish this task. Maybe the child, maybe you're, you're properly motivated and you start digging, but eventually you're gonna get tired you're gonna feel like a lack of progress, just kind of clawing at the dirt with your hands after initial motivation, a lot of energy at first, and you're gonna get tired and kind of give up and feel defeated. But what if I give you a shovel? Same task, same incentives. Maybe you start to feel a little bit better about your progress. You can maintain that motivation and that effort, and you continue to choose to follow directions and complete the task. What if I give you a backhoe? Maybe when I show up, an hour later, you've dug me 10 holes and you're really proud of yourself. Sometimes this is what an ADHD brain is like. A child can be properly motivated, wanna please, wanna do the work, but just can't maintain the effort because they don't have the right equipment right now. A couple of the other myths of ADHD I wanna, I wanna address right now are that it's not just um, a disorder in boys. Uh, boys are overrepresented in our diagnosis of ADHD, but we think that's because more girls tend to be more of the inattentive subtype. And so those are our daydreamers. Those are our kids who maybe you ask them to go clean their room and on their way down the hall to their room, they get distracted by a picture on the wall or they think of a song and you find them 20 minutes later in the room just kind of dancing. And as a parent, you get mad, like, why aren't you following directions? Um, those, the inattentive subtype, which often tends to be girls a little bit more frequently, don't get noticed by teachers as often. They're not disruptive. They're not the class clown. They don't usually have as many behavior problems, but they can be struggling just as much at home and at school. Also, another myth is that ADHD is not something you outgrow. It's not just a childhood disorder. While it's true that a lot of children, a lot of individuals diagnosed with ADHD in childhood will no longer qualify for the diagnosis in adulthood, we think that's for a couple of different reasons. Because ADHD is a brain-based disorder, your brain is continuing to grow and develop. And a lot of the behavior problems and the emotional regulation challenges that come along with ADHD in childhood um, subside or at least decrease in adulthood as your brain continues to mature and develop and you gain more skills. Also, I want to point out that as an adult, you have a lot more control over your environment. There are a lot of successful adults who have ADHD and maybe in school, a traditional school setting was not really the right fit for them sitting quietly in their chair. But as an adult, they chose careers or jobs where they were able to move around a lot or be creative or be hyper or be silly. Um, you know, in my bio, I mentioned I worked with Navy SEALs for four years at the beginning of my career. I had the honor of working for the Navy with Naval Special Warfare. and. I'll tell you that a lot of them have ADHD. And so they naturally selected into careers where they're constantly moving and action oriented and packed. So a lot of our firefighters, policemen, even physicians who are seeing lots of patients and going from different exam rooms um, throughout the day have ADHD. So it's not something you outgrow, but it is something that can change and mature over time. The last kind of common myth I want to address right now at the beginning um, is about hyperfocus. A lot of parents will tell me things like, well, if he has an attention deficit and he can't focus on his homework for more than 10 minutes at a time, why can he focus on video games for hours and hours on end? Isn't he just being lazy or isn't he just being unmotivated or isn't he just being defiant? I said it, I think earlier, but ADHD is not a, a, a disorder uh, with the inability to focus and pay attention. It's the inability to control focus and attention. So things that are very stimulating Things that, things that give you a lot of feedback, things that are very motivating, kids with ADHD can actually hyper-focus on. And so I would argue that hyper-focus is kind of a superpower for people with ADHD.
Now that we've kind of talked about some of the myths of ADHD, we've kind of defined it and given a little bit of the history and statistics. Let's talk about what to do uh, to be ready to make an appointment if you're concerned about ADHD. If some of the things I described sound like what you're experiencing or what you've seen in your children. Here are kind of the next steps. Don't ever hesitate to contact your primary care physician if you are concerned about ADHD. I think this is a critical, this is a very important first step. Uh, it can provide a lot of learning about ADHD. Um, primary care physicians are very well trained to think about a lot of different diagnoses or a lot of different causes for these behaviors and these symptoms. And so you can really begin learning, educating, and even screening for ADHD. Um, primary care physicians can do different things to rule out other medical concerns that might be causing these symptoms. Um, some of the common things are sleep problems, uh, thyroid or hormone concerns. There might be other developmental factors that, that a primary care physician um, has a history of and knows about your child. So a great first step, if you're concerned at all, is going ahead and talking to your primary care physician. Additional information that you should think about at this stage is, is, is collecting information from teachers, uh, other caregivers, people that interact with your child in other settings. Um, again, because ADHD is a brain-based disorder, we should see those symptoms and those problems in multiple settings. We should see these concerns exist across different places, different activities. There might be a varying degree of challenge with the inattention or the hyperactivity, but because it's a brain-based disorder, we should see concerns across every setting. So getting information from other people, other settings, um, places that your child goes to kind of look and see if this is a problem just at home, is this a problem just with children? That's an important next step. While you're kind of getting some of this information, even tracking or documenting what some of these concerns are can help you really kind of step back and analyze where do the challenges exist mostly? Is it mostly at home? Is it mostly at school? Um, you can tailor your supports or start to try things in different settings if you can kind of collect that information and start to think about um, those next steps to helping your child. Once you've done that, the next step is getting a good assessment for ADHD. And a good assessment for ADHD will be comprehensive. By comprehensive, I mean that you are collecting information from multiple people through multiple methods. So some of the best ways to do an ADHD assessment will include parent and caregiver or teacher questionnaires, just answering several lists of questions about ADHD symptoms and other things that might be causing uh, these problems. Direct observations of the child to really kind of observe by a trained um, clinician to kind of look and see how the child behaves and not just relying on outside reporters solely. Uh, you can include a comprehensive assessment can include direct testing of the child, maybe directly testing their attention and focus and ability to resist distractions in a real time setting, as well as memory. Getting feedback from teachers and other caregivers, like I mentioned, including family history, there is a, a, a large genetic component to ADHD. So getting the family history, if six uncles and 12 cousins have ADHD and you're concerned about ADHD in your child, that's important information to know. Develop, reviewing developmental history. Have there, have there been any developmental concerns for the child um, that might better explain why these symptoms and why these challenges are happening? And of course, reviewing school records. Children spend so much time at school being able to look at, are there times in the day where they're really challenged? Um, being able to consider other things like learning disabilities or things that might be causing these problems. A comprehensive assessment will include all of this. Conducting this kind of comprehensive assessment for ADHD can help you rule out some other common causes of the same symptoms or the same behaviors and challenges, or it can help you rule them in. There is, um, There are a lot of comorbid or kind of secondary challenges in children with ADHD. So just because maybe you qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD doesn't mean that you don't also have anxiety, or doesn't mean that you might also have a learning disability like dyslexia. So a comprehensive assessment is going to look at ADHD, but also look at a lot of these other common factors so that we can build a comprehensive, thorough treatment plan. Some of the most common um, concerns 
or other diagnoses that might cause these symptoms um, other than ADHD include anxiety or stress or trauma. If your brain is in a fear state, if your brain is working on danger, there's no way you're listening and paying attention to what the teacher's saying. If you're in a panic state, there's no chance that you're listening to what mom, the instructions mom and dad are saying. If your body is in fight or flight, an outside observer might mislabel that as hyperactivity or impulsivity. And really it's your body's natural response to danger that you have to move, you need to, you need to fidget. Developmental disorders like uh, cognitive disabilities or autism can certainly demonstrate and, and result in features that look like ADHD. And sometimes children ha have a learning disability, which is a processing disorder. So one of the most common ones is dyslexia, and that's about processing the visual signals of letters in your brain. And if your brain is not processing letters and you're having difficulty learning and reading, learning to read and write, some kids might say, you know what, rather than feeling stupid because all my friends can read and write, or this is easier for them, I'm just gonna goof around and try to mask that this is hard for me and we can mislabel kids as ADHD. So sometimes learning disabilities are in play. Other times it's just significant changes or significant stressors in the child's life or the family or the environment. Um, there's been a lot that's gone on the last year, year and a half for kids. So switching to uh, you know, distance learning or online school which is not very stimulating. There's not a lot of feedback sitting and staring at a camera versus being in a classroom. And so lots of people are, are, are experiencing symptoms that could be considered ADHD. So again, a comprehensive assessment is gonna look at a lot of this. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. So it's time for us to hear from our participants now. Um, we're gonna launch a short poll. We would love to hear what your experience with ADHD is. Is it firsthand, perhaps you yourself have been diagnosed with it? Is it secondhand, perhaps somebody that you know um, or maybe a child of yours has been diagnosed? or maybe it's none at all, you're just here to learn a little bit more information about ADHD, or perhaps it's something entirely different and unlisted. Uh, if that's the case, feel free to use our um, Q&A chat and let us know what that is. And I'll just give a couple more seconds. It looks like we've got about 70% participation so far. So I'll leave it open just for a couple more seconds here while we collect responses. Excellent, the numbers are on the rise. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll out here, get those last votes in, and then we'll share the results out with you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share the results. You should be seeing those, Dr. Lloyd and Dr. Balasu. Feel free to make any commentary here. So it looks like we have a little bit of a mix, a little bit of everything, but far and away, about two thirds of you are reporting that you have secondhand experience with ADHD. So I'm assuming that that's either children or spouses or maybe siblings, um, something like that. Very good. Thank you for uh, your participation, everybody. I'll go ahead and hide these uh, results and then we'll move back into our presentation here, the second portion of it regarding treatment. So now that we've talked about ADHD, we've taken a look at what a good comprehensive assessment might include. The next step is what do we do about it? And there's really a combination of three tried and true interventions that we know work for ADHD. First is therapy, second is medication, and third is academic supports. So therapy for ADHD can include a lot of different things. Um, certainly mental health therapy with a counselor, um, a therapist, a psychologist um, can include things like individual therapy with the child, 
Um, depending on the child's age, their specific type of ADHD, their specific challenges, the settings, the concerns that the parents are presenting, the focus of therapy, individual therapy can be on a lot of different things. Some of the most common ones are regulation skills. So for very young kids, learning to regulate their body, regulate their emotions, tolerate frustration, communicate what's going on for them. Um, oftentimes it includes stop and think skills for those impulsive kids who are interrupting or getting in trouble for some of that hyperactive impulsive behavior. Sometimes planning and organizational skills, those, those executive functioning functions that can really suffer in children with ADHD um, is a good focus for individual therapy. Additionally, therapy can include family therapy or parent training. Um, family therapy and parent training can be vital, um, a vital intervention for ADHD because lots of parents, their good traditional classic parenting techniques are just not gonna work quite the same way with a child with ADHD. What we know is that children with ADHD have a harder time with memory. Again, attention is a key component to memory. So cause and effect learning um, does not stick quite as well in children with ADHD. So those good uh, rewards and incentives for positive behavior and punishment or consequences for bad behavior don't stick quite as well in children with ADHD. So parent training or family therapy can be an important component to um, an, uh, an ADHD intervention plan. Additionally, social skills training can be part of therapy for kids with ADHD. Again, they can have a hard time if they're inattentive, if they're impulsive, uh, their social interactions, uh, getting along with other kids, participating in sports or clubs can be really challenging. Lastly, occupational therapy can be really helpful for kids with ADHD. Occupational therapy, different than more mental health therapy or counseling is gonna focus on body regulation, sensory processing, and things that are much more kind of bottom up types of therapy and training. And that's been shown to be pretty effective in kids with ADHD as well. No matter what type of therapy or combination, all of it should include a healthy dose of education about ADHD. Educating the child, educating the parents and caregivers so that you know what's going on, you understand where the child struggles and you can have a lot of compassion and empathy and build those proper supports uh, around the child. Next, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Balasu to highlight uh, medication management for ADHD. Thank you. Um, as mentioned by Dr. Lloyd, medication treatment plays an important strategy in treating ADHD, and the efficacy of medication in addressing, addressing this condition has been confirmed in numerous studies for many years, and uh, in reality, the vast majority of children have a positive response to medications. I would like to start um, by saying that the actual decision to medicate a child diagnosed with ADHD, it can be a challenge for many families. Uh, so it's very important to consult with a specialist, to become very educated in terms of benefits, side effects, and alternative treatments available, and actually make the best decision for your child. When do we consider medications? Most frequently, this decision is based on the severity of symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. Um, those symptoms that tend to be persistent and severe enough to cause functional impairment in school, but also at home and around their peers. When the child uh, has been already engaged in behavioral treatment, several strategies have been implemented at home and at school, but the symptoms remain quite impairing, considering medication management would be the right decision. There are few classes of medications that are very helpful in treating ADHD. The stimulant medication, which is considered the gold standard of treatment for ADHD, is divided usually in two subgroups. The methylphenidate-based stimulants, um, some examples would be Ritalin, Concerta, Focalin, and amphetamine-based stimulants is the other class, um, very well known being Adderall, Dextrodrine, Vivance. I would like to describe in detail each class of medications and include the benefits of those medications as well as the potential side effects. At the end, I will talk about how to initiate treatment and why ongoing monitoring of those medications is highly recommended. 
So uh, the big class of stimuli medication, um, I would start describing those because those medications, as I said, are the oldest and the most established pharmacological agents for treatment of ADHD in children. Um, their efficacy has been confirmed in numerous studies, including in young children, like the preschool age three to six. The most accepted hypothesis in regard to the mechanism of action in the brain for those medications, they basically bind to the dopamine transporter and increase the amount of dopamine available in the synapse. What happens in the brain as a result of this mechanism? And um, as I said, it increases the dopamine and what uh, happens in, in terms of behavior that we notice, uh, it decreases basically the symptoms. So in terms of motor effects, we see decreased fidgeting, decreased excessive talking and noise, improve fine motor control, improve handwriting, Cognitive effects would be reduced distractibility, increase on-task behavior, improve effort and attention, uh, reduce impulsivity. In terms of social um, aspects, uh, we would notice that the kids are able to play and work independently better. Uh, there is less verbal and physical aggression, and in some cases, less defiance toward adults. Most parents ask, what would be the difference between the two types of stimulant medication? What do we choose? We choose the met methylphenidate class or the amphetamine class, Ritalin or Adderall. In terms of efficacy, efficacy, I would say that they're equally effective. You would also expect to see a reduction in symptoms within few days of starting the treatment. No need to wait for several weeks for the medication to be become effective, uh, as we usually see with the non-stimulant medications. Talking about efficacy, the methylphenidate, the Ritalin, is the most commonly used and best studied stimulant. The National Institute of Mental Health Multimodal Treatment of ADHD, the MTA study, showed that treatment with methylphenidate was more effective than intensive behavioral therapy also, the combination of methylphenidate and behavioral treatment was more effective than behavioral therapy alone, and any of those treatments were more effective than treatment as usual in the community. Since there are numerous preparations based on methylphenidate and amphetamine salts, how do we select the best option for each patient? And what is the difference among those preparations? The duration of action among stimulant medication can be different. Some are considered immediate release or short-acting medication, the effect lasting for three to four hours, such as regular, regular Ritalin, Adderall, or Focalin, or extended release, intermediate acting or long-acting preparations, where the effect lasts for 10 to 12 hours, such as Concerta, Adderall XR, Vivance, or Focalin XR. Um, each subclass of stimulants has short-acting preparations as long as long-acting preparations, some of them being easier to swallow, coming in a liquid chewable capsules that can be opened and the sprinkles can be poured in applesauce. If a child takes a short-acting stimulant, he or she may need to take two or three doses per day, while the long-acting medications require only once a day dosing, which could be an advantage. Uh, so no need for medication to be administered at school in the middle of the day. Uh, dosage titration uh, may be required over time to optimize behavior and attention span, and that's one of the reasons that careful monitoring is standard of treatment. If one stimulant medication is ineffective or the child experiences side effects, another preparation should be tried before uh, changing the medication class, even though they belong to the same big family of stimulants. Treatment may be necessary for several years, but there are a few patients who may no longer need treatment by adolescents, just as Dr. Lloyd mentioned. A new study, though, shows that most children don't 
quite outgrow the disorder and in fact it manifests in adulthood in different ways, waxing and waning over a lifetime. Some of the newer preparation can be easier to ingest. Uh, some of them may have a longer duration of action. Um, those are still based on the same type of substances. Uh, they have the same mechanism of action in the brain. Uh, sometimes the cost may be higher for the newer medications. Another um, frequent question that I get about medication, is there a risk of withdrawal if the child misses the medication in the morning? Are there any concerning physical symptoms associating with stopping and restarting the stimulant medication? And the answer is no. These type of medications start working within 30 to 6 minutes after taking the pill. The duration of action, as I mentioned before, varies from short acting to long acting. And the effect of the medication wears off by the end of the day. When the medication wears off, the child may be once again distracted, hyperactive, fidgety, impulsive. There is a small percentage of children that may have an exacerbation of symptoms when the medication wears off, but those cases are rare. Um, some children take the medication every day. Some choose to skip medication over the weekends and uh, school holidays. And we see this especially with kids who have the inattentive type of ADHD. Uh, because there is no schoolwork that needs to be done. And uh, again, there is no concern in regard to stopping the medication and restarting later when school starts. There are few differences between the two classes of stimulants when it comes to side effect profile. And I want to mention that compared with methylphenidate, the preparations based on amphetamine class tend to have a slightly greater incidence of side effects, such as appetite suppression, growth retardation, compulsive behaviors. We tend to notice those side effects more so in younger children than adolescents. An important conversation with parents uh, is about potential side effects, risks. Uh, uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time describing the side effects. So a big one is appetite suppression that we usually see uh, very frequently with stimulants. It's very common. Uh, it can lead to weight loss, growth retardation, which is small, I would say. But is a it comes to be uh, quite a concern, especially for younger children. Uh, there are ways to navigate and minimize the possible weight loss. So we usually recommend children to eat before taking the medication, um, have a high calorie content meal toward the end of the day when their appetite comes back, take breaks from medication during weekends if possible. Another side effect is insomnia, usually worse with the amphetamine preparations and more so with the longer acting preparations. Um, abdominal pain, headaches sometimes, irritability, uh, again, more frequent in younger children. They tend to cry more easily. Nervous habits uh, or motor tics uh, could be an issue uh, sometimes with those medications, although the, the whole um, um, theme about um, tic disorder, Tourette's disorder, uh, ADHD, and stimulant medication, it's a controversial one. Um, mildly elevated blood pressure and pulse, uh, it's another potential side effect, but there is no need for EKGs uh, for uh, children who are on stimulant medications unless uh, there, is, there are symptoms of concern. I want to also make uh, a note here and say all stimulant medications are controlled substances, can be misused, abused. Uh, abusing those substances can lead to severe problems. Therefore, careful monitoring should be in place. Pharmacies provide only one month supply of the medication. They do not provide early refills. Uh, we prescribe those medications very carefully. Uh, what are the long-term effects of stimulant treatment and what's the impact of medication treatment for children diagnosed with ADHD? That's a very important question that I, I, I hear uh, this question quite often from parents. 
Um, so I want to mention stimulants do not lead to drug abuse. Long-term study, studies show that children treated for ADHD have a lower incidence of substance abuse. And in general, treatment versus no treatment for ADHD leads to better results academically, uh, uh, Patients diagnosed with ADHD and treated, um, they're more successful in maintaining a job, have less legal problems later in life. They do not also, those medications, do not have a paradoxical sedative action. The child actually becomes more focused, so is less hyperactive when taking a stimulant medication, but is not sedated. Um, I always recommend careful dosing of this medication. Uh, so we would not run into side effects. Um, already Dr. Lloyd um, explained a little bit the change that happens in terms of symptoms, um, like in a young child versus like a teenage kid and an adult. Uh, I want to say that the medications do continue to be effective after puberty. The symptoms of ADHD may change through the neurodevelopmental stages of a child. So what we usually see in practice, the level of hyper, hyperactivity diminishes after puberty, but they, a, a good percentage of children still have inattentive symptoms. So the medication remains a valuable form of treatment. Um, so, um, what other options, uh, and I'm going to go uh, over the non-stimulant uh, medication now, um, and uh, you know, sometimes this question pops up, why not consider these options rather than the stimulant medication? Um, we do recommend stimulant medication as a first line of treatment because they tend to be more effective than non-stimulant medication. That's the answer. But if the child has tried a stimulant medication and experienced significant side effects, or there are contraindications to use a stimulant medication, such as comorbid medical or psychiatric conditions, or just had a poor response to stimulant medication, the next step is to consider non-stimulant medications. One of uh, the non-stimulant medication is uh, atomoxetine or Stratera. Um, it's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, inhibitor. Uh, it's an approved treatment uh, for ADHD in children over six and also in adults. Um, I do want to mention that there is a new medication. It's called uh, Viloxazine or Culbri. It's an FDA-approved non-stimulant medication, effective also for uh, children between ages uh, 6 to 17. And the effectiveness have been noticed even after a week of treatment. Uh, the second class is alpha-adrenergic agents, like guanfacine, um, short-acting and a long-acting form uh, is called Intunive, and it works for 24 hours. Uh, there is clonidine as well in a short-acting form or a long-acting preparation. It's called CAPFE, and it works usually for 12 hours. The antidepressants, such as bupropion or wolbutrin and tricyclic antidepressants, could be other alternatives um, in terms of non-stimulant medication. Um, I would like to mention a little bit uh, about uh, Stratera um, in terms of side effects, uh, very different from stimulant uh, medication. You have usually, uh, you could have a little bit of sedation with this medication, nausea, dizziness, uh, still an issue with decreased appetite and a slight increase in blood pressure and heart rate is possible. Usually less likely to cause motor tics. Uh, no risk of abuse, misuse, or dependence for those medications, for the non-stimulant uh, medications. Um, so I would like to go to um, uh, 
a little bit to alternative treatments. Um, and actually, I do want to, I don't have it on the slide here, but I wanted to mention some new medications that uh, came quite recently um, and are approved, FDA approved. Uh, one, of, uh, one of them is called, um, it's called the Monarch system, TNS system. It's uh, trigeminal nerve stimulation. It was approved in April 2019 as a non-pharmacological treatment for ADHD. Uh, the research shows improvement in executive function within four weeks of treatment. It's intended to be used at home under supervision of a caregiver. It's basically a, uh, a device of the size of a cell phone that generates low level of electrical impulses, connects through a wire to a small patch, uh, that adheres to the um, patient forehead. And the system delivers low level electrical stimulation to the branches of trigeminal nerve and sends signals to the part of the brain that are supposed to be in involved in the ADHD. Um, another very new treatment, uh, it's actually the first video game treatment, uh, it's called Endeavor RX treatment, uh, was approved by FDA. Um, in uh, 2020, and um, I'm excited to see uh, more studies and, and results. Uh, I have not yet prescribed this type of treatment, but um, uh, sounds promising. Um, I mentioned in the slide, um, omega-3 acids uh, uh, could have a, a benefit in addressing uh, ADHD symptoms. Uh, but the dietary treatments that remain quite popular with some families uh, do not have a very uh, solid um, evidence of being helpful, such as uh, eliminating food dyes, uh, sugar, um, herbal remedies, mega vitamins, uh, food allergies, no scientific evidence that uh, would make a big uh, impact. Um, I'm going to move to starting medication and monitoring medication. I want to um, mention a few things. Uh, so it all starts with establishing a correct diagnosis, uh, making sure that you have in place behavioral interventions, educational support. Again, medication plus behavioral therapy seems to be to get the best results in clinical studies. There are a lot of comorbidities. Dr. Lloyd already mentioned some of, of these uh, in conjunction with ADHD that we cannot ignore. How about a child who has ADHD but is very defiant or has explosive anger outbursts or has motor tics or has very poor sleep pattern? What if the child had heart surgery for con congenital heart defect or seizure disorder? I would recommend consulting with a specialist, work as a team with a child psychiatrist, the pediatrician or family doctor, and the therapist. Careful titration of medication is required, constant monitoring of side effects, regular visits. Um, we usually check weight, height, blood pressure, heart rate. It's pretty much routine when medication is prescribed for ADHD. Um, your doctor also will need feedback from school, um, and the teachers can fill out forms and uh, can give quite valuable information about symptoms and how the medication affects the child. Um, but talking about school interventions and academic support, I will ask Dr. Lloyd to elaborate about important resources available for children with ADHD in school setting. Thank you, Dr. Balasu. So the three interventions for ADHD include therapy, medication management, and the proper supports. Uh, children spend so much time in school that I'm gonna focus really quickly on academic supports. Uh, while we know that most schools are underfunded and understaffed, children with ADHD often require and deserve supports for their unique needs. Now I wanna preface this by saying that there is no correlation between IQ and ADHD. Individuals with ADHD can run the, con the, the entire uh, continuum, the entire spectrum for intelligence. Therefore, you could have a child who's struggling in school significantly, but is plenty smart, plenty intelligent to do the work, to get good grades, to learn. So the proper academic accommodations are really gonna focus on helping them be able to fully participate in the school environment. 
In fact, there are actual federal laws that allow and give uh, rights to students with disabilities and ADHD absolutely falls under those laws. Some of the most common supports and accommodations for school in, include preferred seating, reduced homework load, frequent breaks, allowing fidgets or wiggle seats, um, uh, support from the school counselor, maybe tutoring, or even social skills groups, and much, much more. Thank you so much. Uh, both to Dr. Lloyd and Dr. Balasu. Um, we are, I want to respect everybody's time, so I'm actually going to skip through the next audience poll. Um, I would love to um, wrap this up by talking about how advocacy and how to be an advocate for children with ADHD and also end with some strengths in ADHD and just leave a couple of minutes. I know we got started a couple of minutes late, so I want to leave a few minutes for Q&A at the very end. So back over to you, Dr. Lloyd, for the last two slides. Thanks, Summer. Uh, every, every parent of a child with ADHD can become a good case manager for their child. So as you've probably realized, having therapy, medication management, working with the school means that a parent might need support or develop their own skills in really managing all these different things. So this might mean being a squeaky wheel so that you get the supports and you can work with the systems that your child is in, um, pushing for and attending uh, IEP meetings um, or 504 plans for your, for your child in school, managing follow-up appointments for medication like Dr. Balasu mentioned is gonna be super important scheduling and driving to different therapy appointments, and even implementing various strategies at home or out in other environments. So really quick, some of my favorite things um, and strategies for parents to use at home include visual reminders, planners and calendars, or schedules to help an ADHD child stay organized and on task, breaking down instructions into smaller chunks with frequent, frequent uh, progress check-ins, and oftentimes showing a child with ADHD what to do rather than telling them. We know that in children with ADHD and for a lot of other people, our visual working memory, our memory for what we see is a lot better than our auditory working memory, our memory for what we hear. So breaking things down into smaller chunks, showing them hands-on learning is going to be important. Lastly, I want to wrap up by talking about some of the strengths of ADHD. We focused on how difficult ADHD can be in different settings and different environments, but I really want to emphasize that ADHD can be a superpower. And oftentimes I talk to patients um, with ADHD and explain it to the child like they're a superhero who just gained their superpowers and they just don't quite know how to use them yet. Um, maybe it's the Flash who has super speed and when he first gets his powers, he's burning right through his shoes or he can't stop on time until he gets the proper training, the proper equipment, or even the proper team around him to help him learn how to harness that power. There are lots of famous people, lots of successful people with ADHD. And as I already mentioned, a lot of times as an adult, you choose your environment or you self-select for kind of your brain or your strengths and weaknesses. And one of my favorite examples is Michael Phelps. He was diagnosed with ADHD when he was nine because teachers continued to complain about his inability to focus and pay attention, be disruptive. He even shares a story that in a science class, he turned on all the Bunsen burners just so that the smell of the gas would annoy all his classmates. But his, his mother advocated for him and every time a teacher would say uh, that he can't, couldn't do something, she would answer with, well, how are you gonna help him learn to do that? Or how are you gonna help him develop that skill? She got him in the pool swimming, and as a way of managing his energy, his body, learning how to stick with something that was hard, um, he became the most decorated Olympian in history. That is a great note to end on. Thank you so much for the presentation uh, today. I would love to encourage our attendees, if you can and have questions, feel free to post those. And uh, in the meantime, while you're thinking about those questions, I'm gonna go ahead and remind everybody that we do have a handout. It is available via this platform, GoToWebinar. We will also be posting this to our website. 
In addition, this recording will be available as well as the slides. So you can watch it again, you can share it with others, um, et cetera. There's a lot of great um, meat in this presentation. So I do encourage you to revisit it. And uh, I also want to just quickly go to the Q&A. Um, there is a, a really lovely comment. I'm just gonna read this one out loud. Um, this was just kudos to Dr. Uh, Ryan, um, Ryan Lloyd. Um, it says that um, Dr. Ryan has made an amazing difference in my child. One of the things, um, let's see. Uh, Yep, so uh, the question is, I am not sure to, where to go. Um, the, the child is in, um, let's see here. Sorry, I'm, just bear with me here. Oh, trying to get the official diagnosis, yes. Um, and school starts soon, so the fear is that the, um, the child doesn't have the tools in place yet to be successful. So um, any thoughts or comments on that? from either um, Dr. Balasi or Dr. Lloyd? Yeah, just generally, I would say that the, the professionals uh, qualified to diagnose ADHD are, of course, psychologists, psychiatrists, even primary care physicians. So how I mentioned early on in the presentation that starting with your primary care physician, um, they won't necessarily have as many resources or tools for a full comprehensive assessment like psychologists or the team of like psychologists, psychiatrists and, and primary care physician, but that'd be a great place to start. Um, I wanna emphasize that schools don't diagnose and schools don't treat, but if a child is struggling academically, let's say they're two grade levels behind in a certain subject, it's absolutely within your rights to formally request an IEP and the school will do an evaluation to try to determine if they qualify for certain supports. So even without the diagnosis, you can still advocate for your child to get supports in school. Sometimes the diagnosis first makes the school stuff a little bit easier, um, but it doesn't have to be in that order necessarily. Very good. Thank you. Now, here's a quick interesting one. I do want to, um, you're getting a lot of thank yous in uh, as feedback. Uh, so great presentation. Um, there is one quick question um, that is asking about uh, any place for caffeine in the treatment of ADD or ADHD. Um, I would, I would probably uh, suggest um, you know, like a formal evaluation and uh, considering um, the like more valuable treatments that we have in terms of uh, of medications. I would not necessarily encourage, uh, as I mentioned before, alternative treatments tend to not be as effective. So, so I would definitely go for you know the. Um, treatments that are, um, you know, well studied and the efficacy of those uh, study proves that uh, those, the medications are, or, you know, other forms are more uh, of treatment are more effective. So that's, that's what I would recommend. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, one last question here. Is ADHD known to be hereditary? Mm -hmm. There is a strong component, genetic component, as uh, as um, Dr. Lloyd mentioned before. Uh, so I would say uh, yes, there is there is that factor for sure. Yeah, research shows that there's a strong genetic component, and so I think when you're thinking about a treatment plan, that's why things like parent training or even family therapy is going to be super important. Um, I have lots of patients over the years where the parent was newly diagnosed as an adult. And so they thought, oh, wow, that's why I struggled so much as a kid. So now they're motivated to get their kids support earlier than they did or vice versa. They got their child diagnosed and then they learned about ADHD and started to think, I wonder if I actually have ADHD too. So absolutely. Very good. And uh, since you said that, I just can't help but ask one last question. I'm sorry, I know that I said three, but here's the final final. Um, how early should we start pursuing the diagnosis? We're in therapy, outpatient, or sorry, uh, OT, and have an IEP going into kindergarten. 
That's a great question. I think we can rely we can reliably diagnose ADHD pretty early on, especially with that comprehensive evaluation. Um, I my my kind of like guideline is once a kid's in school uh, formally, because even in daycare, even in good preschool programs, you're just not having quite the same demand on a child's focus and attention and their mental control as you do once you are like in kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And again, those academic supports you can request for the testing if a child is falling behind their peers. Um, it's really that comparison that we might look at. And of course, the treatment plan can can depend on a, a family's comfortable 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 ability uh, with medications or with things. So I think going in with an IEP is a great start. Starting with OT for a younger child is absolutely what I would recommend. Um, but this sounds like about the right age once they're in school and you can kind of get some of that teacher feedback in comparison to peers. Um, yeah, I think that's a good time. Awesome. Thank you so much. I just really um, want to um, thank our doctors for being with us today. And this is sort of above and beyond their normal um, clinical duties. And so I really appreciate the time. And you all are just um, really lucky to have this as a resource. Um, feel free to revisit it. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletters where we will send out alerts about upcoming webinars. And also after this webinar closes, you'll automatically get prompted to take a three question survey. We read every single comment so that we can make uh, our future webinars even better. So finally, just thanks again to our um, doctors who've joined us today, Dr. Lloyd and Dr. Balasu. I really appreciate your expertise in sharing with us uh, what you already know about ADHD. And thank you so much to our attendees. Until next time, Stay healthy and be well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.